I think we are the most difficult environment for an animal. Nothing is more complicated than living with humans. And the least we can do is help our friends, our dogs, to cope, to understand how to fit in. So uh, my work is now mainly based on teaching people how to understand dogs and help dogs and feel empathy for the dogs rather than changing dogs' behavior or making dogs um, fulfill the, the owner's expectations and needs. And of course, this is quite, sometimes it's quite difficult to understand, especially uh, when the whole culture is about punishing the wrong behavior or inhibiting the wrong behavior and uh, reinforcing the good behavior, which to me sounds quite similar in some case, because it's always about uh, the behavior we see and how we want our dog to change the behavior to feel better. So it's mainly about us. So my presentation is about something that changed my, my work and also my life with my dogs and in general, my perception of dogs. Um, something that is sometimes difficult to uh, understand because we're so much used now to think in terms of reinforcers and, and behaviors that it's, it is sometimes difficult for people to see the difference. So hopefully I will be able to show you why to me it is different and why I, I use coping strategies to help dogs uh, and owners, of course. So let's start with the presentation. Somewhere it's here and here. And here we go. So, yes. Yes, I, I am still there. <laughs> I'm still terrified of, of being live, but still. It's better than last time. Last time I was more worried that something wouldn't work. I already make apologize if Sonia will start screaming in some moments because she's a great guardian dog and it could happen that someone dares to walk in front of our garden. So if you feel, you know, if you hear her screaming, it's just her guarding attitude that makes her. So coping strategies for dogs and owners. Um, just a very quick view of how it all started. In, um, in the early 90s, I saw um, a demonstration of a monduring and I thought it was the most beautiful dog sport I ever seen. So I wanted uh, to train a dog for monduring and compete in monduring. So I got my um, first Malinois, Matisse. Matisse is a surname because people tell me uh, it's a female. She was a female, and it's a male name was well, surname. So she was she was she, and she was called Matisse. Um, when she was around seven months of age, she attacked without biting, but she attacked another another dog, and and it was. I, I felt so sorry for, for the other dog, of course, but also for her because she couldn't cope with the presence of another dog. And I found out that um, she was, it was easier for her if she was grabbing something. So I started leaving to her a Kong toy so that she could chew the Kong toy and just get rid of all that stress chewing it and holding it and chewing it. And at the time, uh, trainers used to say to, to owners, never allow your dog to play with a toy when other dogs are around because it's dangerous because they can end up in a fight. And in my experience was, was different. I mean, for my, in my case, um, using a toy was making her feel good enough to cope with the presence of another dog. So I was kind of, um, uh, 
uh, not paying any attention to the rule that we should not use toys. And well, it, actually I started using toys during dog dog interactions because in, in my experience, having a toy can help some dogs cope in that context. Um, and another experience back to the 90s is that uh, I, I don't know how long you've been in the dog world, but in the 90s, it was quite usual uh, to uh, teach people to train the dog to sit. So the dog is jumping on people, the dog has to sit. The dog is um, jumping on you when you go back, when you come back from, from work, teach the dog to sit. The dog uh, is uh, pushy and uh, excited uh, before getting the food bowl, teach the dog to sit and stay in the sit. So it was all about the sit. And I remember thinking, if I, if I well, if I am excited and frustrated or upset and or angry or um, insecure, uh, would I feel better if someone tells me to sit and meditate? You know, my sister does it, and and she's perfectly fine with that. I'm not the kind of person. It doesn't work with me. At least now, probably if I get wiser and older, it would work. So I was thinking. What would happen to me if someone tells me to sit? And I would feel, I wouldn't feel good. I, I would feel awful, really, it, especially if I had to sit. So I thought maybe instead of teaching dogs to sit, I can use the same strategy I've been using with my Malinois. So I was telling people, if you go back home and your dog is jumping on you and, and you don't know how to, to uh, deal with, with the dog in that moment, you can bring a toy with you to your workplace. You go back home, you tell the dog, look at the toy, look at the toy, um, give the toy to the dog, uh, change dresses, play with the dog. And eventually you will go back home, leave the toy in the house, ask the dog to, to go and, and find the toy and you have the time to change dresses and, and play. Um, and the yellow Labrador is because it actually happened with an owner and the dog and it was a yellow Labrador and it worked. It worked pretty well, I'm still using it. Um, so then, I, in 2007, I adopted a um, border collie, Rizu. He's still with us, 14 years old and still rocking. And um, so I went to the breeder. I, I, I took him, brought him home. It was in the evening. So I uh, kept him with me in my room. I had other dogs at the time too. In the morning, I wanted my um, puppy to meet my other dogs. So I was sitting um, in, in the garden with a puppy on my lap and my Malamute, and she was a very nice dog, approached it just to sniff him to, to uh, make contact with him in a friendly way. And he attacked her and uh, tried to bite her in the neck for six times. And I thought, oh, I have a problem. Uh, after that, I, I also asked the owner, the, the breeder about the behavior and only then the breeder told me that the father had huge issues with other dogs. So maybe it's also something related with the, the genetics, but for sure he was highly, highly reactive towards other dogs, any dog. I remember myself uh, putting him into uh, a field with an adult very uh, sociable and skilled um, uh, Newfoundland male, three years of age. And I remember him spitting the fur with the, the Foundland trying to get out of the gate. And he was seven months of age. He was, he was really intense. So I stopped. I, when he was seven months of age, I stopped making him interact with other dogs because he was attacking any other dog. And I, since he was a puppy, I started to walk him on leash with two leashes. One was attached to his collar or the harness, and the other one was attached to a rope. So every time we 
uh, he saw a dog and he started to get um, stiff and roused and aggressive and reacting, um, he could ask me the rope and kill the rope. So he was grabbing the rope and growling and, and, and shaking it um, instead of attacking the other dog. And in 2007, well, 2000, yes, late 2007, I went to a conference and I was explaining to people that I was, was using that kind of strategy with, with my own dog. And since I needed to write down a full presentation, I started to do some research and I got a better understanding of the, the, the reason it works because I started to read things about coping strategies. So, and name what I was doing as a coping strategy. It, it ended up that I was wrong. <laughs> I mean, at least uh, it wasn't the, the full story because coping strategies are not what I, at the time I thought they, they are. I only thought of coping strategy in terms of something that the dog likes and that helps the dog to cope in a situation, while coping strategies have much broader meaning. And so it's not the same. So I, I hate, um, usually I hate writing down what uh, the no or not word. So saying what's wrong or it's not like that. I much prefer the yes. But in this case, it's important for me to, um, to tell you, to tell people that coping strategies are not about reinforcements. So it's not about um, changing the behavior, it's not about counter conditioning, it's not, and we will see it uh, later, it's not about desensitization or control or education or training. Uh, and, and that's what makes uh, coping strategies so difficult for people because we are so, so much into all of this that to change pers perspective, at least for me, in the beginning is quite difficult. So you see two of my dogs. One is a very young Uma. She is now nine years old. In the picture, she was around seven, six, seven months of age. And uh, she, you can see that she's grabbing a ball. So we were actually um, staging the picture, but that's what she did. Actually, she was destroying all the pillows. She loved to destroy pillows. She, she didn't kill herself eating it, um, but definitely destroying was, was her thing. And um, in, in the other picture is my youngest dog, Zonne. She's a French bulldog. She is now one year and a half. And she is more destructive than any other dog I had um, previously. So she is the, the, the really a destroyer. She, she can destroy anything. And the, the one reason I put these two pictures is that instead of uh, preventing the destructive behavior, instead of stopping it or uh, putting the dog in, in a cage or telling no or whatever, giving the dog a bone or, or, or you know, trying to change the behavior. What I do, I provide the dog uh, any kind of different items to be able to destroy. So you can see uh, Zonne's personal destruction box. She doesn't need a destruction box anymore. So she has toys and she has things that she likes to destroy, especially card box and very old bones. So she likes to chew them. And the uh, sheepskin, that's her favorite uh, toys and whatever. But she doesn't have, she doesn't need a destruction box in the house. While when she was younger, she, she had it and she was using it. And I am teaching people to have a destruction box if the dog needs to chew uh, and, and, uh, and play and, and uh, destroy something, the dog can actually pick an item from the destruction box and do whatever they want, the dog wants. So what's coping strategies? I will not talk very much about the theory. It's, it's a huge amount of information about it. There is a huge amount of information about the theory. So it's quite easy to access to, to information about this, this topic. I will talk more about my 
personal experience. So there's no black and white slides for that reason, because it's all black in this case. Um, so coping strategies are a response to aversive situation, the behavioral and physiological force must a situation, coherent set of behavior and um, physiological stress responses, which are consistent over time and which are characteristic to a certain group of individuals because there are studies about personality and coping strategies, for example, in rats. Um, there are rats that have a, a, a long, um, group, a bigger um, latency um, for attacking and dogs and rats that have a shorter, longer or shorter latency for attack. And that's related to the personality and, and it's not um, uh, context related. A coping style is defined as correlated state of individual behavioral and physiological, uh, sorry, uh, you already seen it. The impact of aversive stimuli or stressor is determined by the ability of the organism to cope with the situation. So these are the definition. And you can see uh, three pictures of Grisou when he was uh, a puppy. And he is now he's, uh, um, in the field with me and uh, with an adult, highly sociable, highly skilled uh, male golden retriever, Mago. Uh, Mago is coming close to us because I was playing with, um, with Grisou and he was just checking on us and Grisou leaves the ropes, threatens uh, Mago, and then goes back to the rope. But you can see that he's jumping and almost grabbing my hand because there is a, an increase in his level of aggressiveness. So he's not um, able to fully focus on the rope. He's more uh, just uh, trying to get rid of all that stress. So he's not completely focused. And you can see the, the switch in colors because he um, uh, the yellow is when he's coping and he's using the, the toy to cope with the presence of Mago. The red is when he is attacking. And then we go back to the yellow with Grisou playing, also increasing the distance, as you can see in the picture. So these are uh, pictures from the test uh, I have done, some with the X fighting pitbull a project and some more recently in shelters with the instructor course. Um, and you can see many different, re many different uh, reactions to the doll. Um, so uh, coping strategy is not about a single uh, behavior or a single set of behaviors. Any dog, a, a different, any different dog can uh, have different, um, display different behaviors, but we can, uh, at least we can group uh, all these pictures in three different uh, categories. In the first one, you can see a more sociable attitude. So the first dog on the top left is um, definitely uh, friendly and social. He's frontal because of course he's on leash, we were testing. So the, the situation wasn't that easy for the dogs, but he's sociable. The German Shepherd is, is more stiff, um, more worried, but no signs of, of uh, threatening, no signs uh, of um, active avoidance. And, uh, and um, the Pitbull mix, Mastiff mix, mix or whatever it is, uh, is more intense, but still not, not aggressive nor fearful. In the, the middle section, you can see um, reaction associated with more with fear. So a fearful approach and, and then in, in, we can see an increase in, uh, in the avoidance uh, strategy. So dogs that are actively moving, staying away or moving away from the doll. And in the last uh, free picture, you can see um, a reaction associated with arousal or uh, with uh, aggression. So the last two pictures, Lion and Annibale, the two male pitbulls were uh, attacking the doll. So um, different behaviors, but we can, um, we can see uh, different categories of um, coping strategies. Sorry, sometimes my English 
gets really bad when I lose connection. So the one way of um, describing, there are many, many different ways of categorizing and describing coping strategies. This is one that I found useful when we are talking about dogs. So one way of describing coping strategies is thinking of four different um, styles of threat of coping strategies, escape, remove, search, and wait. So an effective strategy to get rid of an aversive stimulus is to increase distance to the stimulus, escape behavior. And you can see the picture of Sintra, uh, Paulina Scalde Agua, uh, displaying fear and avoidance uh, towards a young uh, male, Sam. Then we have remove instead of escaping the aversive stimulus, an animal can also act upon it and try to remove it. The enhancement of aggressive behavior that can be observed in situation of frustration is perhaps also a consequence of this coping strategy. And you can see the picture of two males. One is a Cane Corso Maremma Sheepdog Cross and the other one is a Bosseron. And they are fighting along the fence. And then we have the last two strategies. If the aversive situation consists of the absence of a stimulus to release a specific behavior, example, feeding, such behavior is the adaptive coping response appetitive behavior. So, and in the picture, you can see a young Zone uh, who is trying to reach me. So what she wants in that moment is not food, but it is social interaction. If an animal can neither escape from nor remove an aversive stimulus, it is not adaptive to repeat these coping strategies over and over again. As an alternative, the animal might conserve energy and wait for a spontaneous change in the aversive situation, and we have the apathetic behavior. So if I was not opening the gate, she could try for as long as, as she, she felt the need to, to try, but she would not uh, get a result. So the, the only alternative is to wait, to do nothing. And that's mainly why people think in my opinion, I don't want to be I started this discussion about this, but in my opinion, this is why most people think um, teaching dogs to stay in a cage works. So um, I will talk, as I told, I will talk, probably at all, I forgot. I will talk about um, dogs on leash. Well, I was saying that I was discussing about the use of, of choke collars. And, and I think in, in our world, uh, how dogs are managed on, on the leash has a huge impact on, on the dog well-being. So it is so important that, that we as, as trainers and as dog owners find the good solutions that prevent people from using coercion. And in, during the, the, the years, I have seen so many different strategies because it's, it's a huge, huge topic and it's a huge problem for owners. So there are many, many different ways to deal with uh, the dog pulling on leash or reacting on leash or misbehaving on leash. And I have just uh, listed the, the one that come, came to my mind when I was writing the presentation. So they watch me default behavior, keeping the dog under the threshold, the sit, heel position, and then using um, some tools like the easy walk or the gentle leader, even the calming cap, although I think it, it just disappeared. It was, it, it, people were using the calming cap in the early uh, 2000, and then I haven't seen it for a while. And of course, you wore the best, ignore the rest, and teaching the dog to be calm, or, and, and so on. So uh, this is my mindset about a, dog, a reactive dog on, uh, on leash. I have reactive dogs. Grisou is a re was a reactive dog at, at least. He's now 14 years old and then he's quite peace and love. Um, Kanji is a, re a reactive dog. He started to attack other dogs because he got scared when he was four months of age. Um, Ebenez chased him. He was deadly scared after the event. And when he was around seven, eight months old, he started attacking the other dog to feel in control, um, to feel like he had the power not to be in danger because he was dangerous. That's my explanation. 
so I'm pretty used to deal with a problem, not just as a trainer, but also as an owner. So when we think of a dog in uh, on leash, we usually think of with, with a reactive issue, we usually focus on three different phases. So the phase when the dog is uh, normally walking on leash and then something triggers the dog reaction. So the dog stop, gets stiffs and um, display huckless and, uh, and starts to uh, focus intensely, intensely on the stimulus and then the reaction. So these are the three phases that normally are considered when dealing with a reactive dog. Um, when we think in terms of coping strategy, so uh, aggressiveness as a strategy to remove uh, a, a problem, a danger, um, we can imagine to picture the three phases like this. So uh, there's a, the, the level of stress is increasing, and when it um, goes up a certain threshold, the dog reacts and the reaction, we can name the reaction as a coping strategy. So coping strategies are all behaviors displayed when the dog is under stress and is trying to cope with the stress. Uh, so um, back to the, the three phases, uh, we now can talk about the reaction as a coping strategy, um, but also uh, in my practice, I add a four phase fourth phase um, so it's not just walking normally on leash um, getting aroused triggered by something reacting it, there is also something that comes after all this and i call it um, safety plus coping strategy i used to call it a coping strategy but i think i, I was wrong so lisa sorry if you heard <laughs> this bit of the presentation before I changed it, uh, but I think it's better now uh, because uh, it's not only about um, displaying a behavior that helps the dog to cope with, um, with stress, but it's mainly um, displaying a behavior that helps the dog to get rid of stress, to um, decrease the level of stress in a safe uh, context. So this is for me, the meaning of the fourth phase. It means that um, the difference between the phase three and the phase four is that the phase four only begins if the dog is not more feeling in danger. So um, during all these years, uh, when I saw and I tried also using different strategies to deal with reactive dogs on leash. Uh, what I saw is that um, most, if not all, uh, the procedure focused on the free, first three phases. So uh, walking uh, the dog on leash and, for example, preventing the dog from getting uh, um, triggered so keeping the distance or asking the dog to watch um, the owner in the face instead of focusing on the environment. So it's controlling the dog or controlling the environment, asking people not to get come too close or teaching the dog to sit or to stay in the heel position. And um, so it and when the dog is reacting, um, well, then it depends, of course, on the kind of, of um, methodology and approach that we have. So I will not consider all the inhibition stuff, but of course, who uh, chooses to use certain tools will focus mainly on the reactive phase. Mm, so they will pay no attention to the dog uh, when the dog is uh, neutral is not reacting. Neutral is 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 a wrong word, but um, say is not reacting. It's better, and they will only pay attention to the dog if the dog is giving some signals of becoming reactive or is actually reactive. While when I when I um, work with owners of reactive dogs and I work with the dog on leash, 
I focus on the first and the fourth phase. So, and mainly, mainly on the fourth one in the beginning, especially. Uh, because at, when, when you have an, a reactive dog on leash, what happens is that you walk um, expecting, waiting for a reaction, especially if you have a dog that really makes you feel vulnerable and insecure and like, like you are losing control. So it's like walking on a minefield. You, you are watching everything and, and expecting your dog to react. If the dog reacts, then your expectation is it's negatively, it's not positive, but it's still fulfilled. So you, you get what you were waiting for and the dog is reacting. And once the dog reacts, you will be even more um, worried and aware of everything that's going on. So your brain is never uh, at rest. You never switch off the, the fight and flight um, reaction uh, response system. Yeah, system is a better word. So it's, to me, when I talk about coping strategies for dogs and owners, I'm not specifically working on, on the dog emotional state and motivation. I half of the work is on the owner because you're linked through the leash and whatever you feel, and it's part of the dog experience when walking on leash. So if I am worried uh, and scared of losing control or being, you know, um, judged by people, for example, if you have a small dog, you maybe are not in worried that the dog can kill someone, but still people can judge you as a bad owner. Um, you will never be really able to help the dog. So I want people to uh, focus on something positive, so forget about the reaction, and to focus on anything that will make themselves and the dog feel better after the reaction. And of course, many, many people, especially those who have uh, some kind of training experience, are so scared of reinforcing aggressiveness. So the, the main objection that I get is, so my dog was threatening another dog or, some, or a person, and you're asking me after the reaction to do something that makes my dog happy and feel good, and, and that will reinforce the reaction, the aggressiveness. And, and it is, I, I know it, it doesn't work like that, I'm sure. I'm, I'm totally and completely sure that it doesn't work like that, but I, I understand why people uh, is so scared about it because we think in terms of reinforcement and and punish and punishments and we are stuck into that um conditioned perspective so um so this is um i i was trying to to make thing uh visible so i hope i hope it it kind of works so let's say um, I have my dog on leash and my dog sees another dog, reacts, bark, lunges, growls, and, and, and I just uh, do nothing. I stay there and do nothing. So um, there is no um, increase in the intensity in the arousal and uh, it, it, there is actually nothing happening. So that uh, strategy is not working. In, in, uh, the dog is not moving away and I'm not moving away. I'm not doing anything. So everything stays in place like it is. The dog might try to find a different uh, coping strategy. And for example, uh, seeking my support. So come to me and uh, ask me to do something. That happens quite often. Um, so we are switching from one coping strategy to a different one. Uh, and let's say that if I stand still while my dog is aggressive and I, I move away when my dog is seeking support from me, 
um, the dog is feeling better. So the second strategy is more efficient for the dog in reducing um, the level of stress. Then I can also do something um, that makes my dog feel good. And I call this phase the phase of recovery. So you can see in the picture the dog reacting, asking for support, and then playing, grabbing the leash, but whatever was the one picture that I found. Um, so that's exactly how I work. So I make one coping strategy work better. So of course, I don't let a dog attack another dog to get rid of the other dog or a person to get rid of the other person. I wait to see if the dog is choose is able to choose and is choosing a different coping strategies. And I and that coping strategy will work because, for example, if the dog is asking for distance, I will ask the owner to follow the dog and move away from the dog or from the fence or from me or whatever. And to play, for example, with a dog playing is not the only the only coping strategy that I associate with the safety. Uh, context, we will see other different um, activities. So why do, why, why it works in my experience, why it works? Um, because when we do something uh, to make our dog feel better after uh, a reaction, we work on many different um, consequences yeah right <laughs> sorry many different consequences so what i want to produce is that i want to help my dog to recover my dog got stressed and i want my dog to feel better in a shorter time i want my dog to recover faster not only to recover it helps me and my dog to switch mindset from the fight and flight system to um a positive interaction and the um, an enjoyable activity, something good, something positive. It can, it can, it's it's a dog choice, and it highly depends on how good we are um, doing it. It can become the solution, and uh, to to explain this, let me say about my experience about uh, with uh, with kanji kanji is my youngest german shepherd the one who started to be reactive towards dog when he turned eight seven eight months old so he was um attacking other dogs on site um he couldn't stand the sight of other dogs so what i did is i um, i used the, the ball like with grizu um i used the distance so moving away from uh, from the other dog and playing with the ball if he cannot especially if he couldn't play uh with the ball when we were close um but eventually he was the one who uh, made um who found the, the the best coping strategy and being a male and turning into adult, adulthood he started to use urine marking as a coping strategy so now when he sees another dog he doesn't need the ball he doesn't ask the ball uh, he just looks for a place to urine mark so we run we walk or we run i have no problems running after uh, with my dogs to, to to a tree to make my dog urine mark so he sees the dog he can't cope and oh, sorry he can't cope actually he doesn't react and he just looks for a place to urine mark so in in his case i was offering him the ball as a solution myself playing with me and the distance and be happy with me while he now prefers um the scent marking as a solution uh i am part of the solution because uh he is on leash and i am actually following him to allow him to remark uh I have this idea of the um, 
emotional balance of an experience. So if something negative happens, but in, in, in the same context, also something positive happens, maybe we are able to change uh, the, the general perception of the dog, of, of the context, of the experience. So maybe if we add something positive, uh, the, the long lasting memory of the event will not only be negative. So uh, I try to, for example, when I do uh, interactions with my dogs, uh, sometimes my dogs help me assessing aggressive dogs, dogs in general. And sometimes the, my dogs have to meet, they don't have, they can choose not to, but they, they meet dogs that are very um, unbalanced emotionally, they, they are in, in a bad emotional state. And so they do not communicate, they do not interact properly. So it's quite, it's quite difficult for my dogs to cope with that kind of dogs. So before getting back to the car or to, to the place, uh, I spend some time with my dog, making my dog jump into the pond or playing with the ball or cuddling my dog or walking my dog uh, in the place so that when my dog gets back, the, 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 mem the last memory is something positive. I don't want my dog to get out from the car, get in the field, meet a, a, a dog that's in the bad emotional state and back into the car. So what happened in my, in my experience, what happens if, if the, what I call the recovery phase is, is really effective, the dog might, might uh, anticipate uh, that kind of uh, strategy uh, to um, coping strategy two or coping strategy one. So by the end, you can hopefully um, have a dog on leash that is choosing not to react. And it's important that it's the dog choice. So I'm doing nothing to make the dog not react. I have my dog on leash. My dog can watch the other dog, not watch me. The dog can watch whatever my dog wants. So the dog uh, can see the other dog, watch the other dog, and he can on his own choose to play with the ball, move away, uh, urine mark, roll on the ground, whatever. Um, ask me for, for cuddles, whatever my dog wants. My dog can get anything from me in that moment if what my dog's is um, asking, it make, makes him feel better than reacting and it's a better and more efficient coping strategy that helps in coping with stress. So you see here a dog that is watching something and then playing with the owner without reacting aggressively. And of course you can say it doesn't work like that or you don't believe me. This is a practical example. So in the first picture, I told the owner of the main German Shepherd that he could follow uh, the dog um, uh, and he had to stop when the other dog was showing signs of fear. So that was the instruction. You can follow your dog. If the other dog shows signs of fear, you have to stop and stand still. The other dog is off leash, so the other dog can move away. Um, Zaki with Lenka is uh, the, the, um, the Dutch Shepherd and she's highly sociable and highly skilled and has an amazing relationship with the owner. So she knows we were not putting her into danger and you can see that she is staring at him um, and kind of, of uh, trying to, um, to deal with the situation, um, but she is still quite confident in, in the context. And also Lenka is very confident in the context because she knows I will control the owner. So, uh, they are too close, the dog is reacting, and it's an adult male react, intact male reacting against a female, which tells a lot about his emotional state when on leash, at least. Well, in, he's in general, is quite reactive. And then you can see, so the, the level of stress is now increasing, his coping strategy is to remove, even thought he's facing an adult female and very sociable and nice one. And then you can see that he is playing with the ball 
And that's when the moment when I ask people to play with the ball and they tell me, but I will reinforce the reactive, the reactive uh, um, behavior. So uh, this is another example. Uh, this is a young um, um, Labrador, or probably Labrador cross, male, in fact, in Italy, most of um, dogs that are not from shelters or rescues are intact. Um, and uh, so he was, the, the owner was sitting in front of me with the dog on leash. The dog is reactive towards dogs and people, highly reactive. And uh, so you can see in the picture that he's lying and checking on me. So he's paying, he's quite um, careful about what I do. I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm not doing anything, anything special. And then someone is walking uh, through and you can see the change in, in, the, in the attitude. So the wide of the eye, the stiffness is uh, focusing, intensively focusing. And then you can see the change in, in the mouth so the mouth gets smaller and you know they lift the, the lip and they pull the the corners of the lip forward and that anticipates the full attack he fully um attacked of course it was a leash and he didn't bite anyone but he fully attacked the man and the the only work that i have done is the work that i've been talking to and this is exactly the same dog one month after exactly the same situation. So checking on me and then uh, softening the eye, breathing and relaxing. So I did nothing but the work on coping strategies. So I don't know if it, it will work. I have no idea. Usually videos do not work on, on Zoom and on, uh, on Facebook, but you have the, the video on um, uh, on the event, if you want to see it. And just to explain what you will see, this is uh, one of my students. She came to me with um, an, uh, an adult male dog adopted from a shelter in Rome, La Muratella. Uh, his name is Pin. I honestly don't remember if he's intact or neutered. Honestly, I don't remember. Probably neutered. Um, so the problem was, to me, the problem was that he, he was highly inhibited, not because of her. She, she got him from the, 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 the shelter and he was like, um, he was like in a box. He, he didn't express feelings or motivation. He was just walking like a zombie somehow so i told her to me he is inhibited and she said can you do something to change this and i said yes i can but that will mean he will get worse and and in my i have the feeling that he will get really worse and she said doesn't matter if that's the price to make him feel better i am ready to pay it so i did it uh, I made him interact with my female German Shepherd. I, by the time I had a very sociable and very strong female German Shepherd. And uh, after that experience, he started to um, uh, react and react really uh, intensively. He, he was not only threatening people and dogs, he was grabbing the leash and moving towards the end. The end. So she told me, uh, you were right, and I have a bigger problem now, but you know, I want to work uh, on it. So what can I do? I told her about using a toy, but he will not play with a toy. So she started using a very big uh, rawhide bone that he was grabbing and holding while walking on leash and that made him feel better. And she also, when he started to get stiff, she also would stop, bend, um, so lower herself and talk to him in a nice and friendly way so that he would relax and uh, and they have an amazing relationship Mara and Spin and you can see in the video that she is um, using a lot of the techniques that I use so uh, following the dog but she has to cross um, the uh, in front of the defense where there is a, a male 
a reactive Doberman, so she has to walk in front of the Doberman. Um, so she can't follow him because she has to go back to the car. So she, she can't really move away from the problem. Uh, so she's shortening the leash in a very nice and gentle manner to, again, to help him cope is uh, not about um, controlling the dog, it's more about feeling safe, not being alone, left alone, facing the problem. And she's using a stick to help him uh, coping. So I don't know whether you can see it. If not, I will just skip it and, and we... So following the stick, following Doberman, Barking, she's now using the body to tell the dog they're moving in different direction, shortening the leash. The dog is not able to follow her and tries to move away from, from the Doberman, but they have to walk in a different direction. So shortening the leash very gently, giving the dog the time to understand the different direction. Always the stick. So now you can see that the dog is getting stiff and then lowering the head and moving away. And as soon as, soon as the dog gets better, she length, she has the, the, the leash longer. She lengthens the leash. So uh, when I talk about safety, I refer to a set of information that I give to owners. And the, the, the set includes three different elements. So it's um, something that we do with our dogs to make the dog feel better. Um, it's how we feel if we feel connected and positive doing it. And it's about the distance because sometimes dogs can focus on us, on playing, on feeling good and stay with us or do something only if they are uh, at the right distance, especially in the beginning. So what I do is I work on three set of elements, distance in meters, and it's about the perception, it's not about actually meters. Belonging is the attitude, so Con being connected with the dog and be positive with the dog, even after the dog has displayed some aggressive behavior and the coping strategy. As I said, the coping strategy can be of different uh, kind. And you can see here some of the coping strategies that uh, I, um, I found in pictures. So Kanji is uh, using the tire to cope with a Zonne who wanted to mate with him. Uh, Zonne is using the sheepskin. Then you we have the fox terrier displaying cut sheep. Uh, some dogs run. Some dogs uh, become too intent, too focused, and and we say hormonal or sexual in the interaction. Uh, scent marking, urine marking, and chewing a log or um, playing with water sometimes he's swimming, um, the, doing the, the target uh, training, touching the hands. Some dogs can use trained behavior as a coping strategy, uh, rolling on the ground. And then you see, uh, uh, well, two, there are two pictures here that talk about some problems we might have using coping strategies. One is playing in the water because the Doberman used to jump into the pond and, and started um, pawing the water and, and trying to, to, to bite uh, the sprinkles and she would not get out. And the other one is Kanji who was not leaving the ball because I was asking him something that for him was too much, little too much. So he, the stress um, was higher during the training and he was using the ball as a coping strategy so he would not leave the ball he was not able to leave the ball in that moment and when he doesn't leave the ball i think maybe i have done something wrong in the training i don't think my dog is dominant or i'm not a leader or something like that uh, i'm running out of time so i'll be very quick i made a survey in facebook just 
uh, for my personal interest asking uh, owners who are um, say they uh, used to uh, used to talk about coping strategies asking which were the coping strategies they dog more efficient for the for their dogs and um, so I was able to find some difference in different um, breeds um, group of breeds and so for example in shepherd dogs uh, most of owners were uh, referring to the ball. It's either holding, chewing, playing, chasing. I don't know. I should have asked the question in a better way. Tug of war, chewing, holding something, social contact, barking, running. Then uh, we have uh, retrievers and owners were um, uh, answering that the dogs were using uh, as a coping strategy, chewing, especially paper or wood holding something, um, playing with toys, uh, asking for social contact, and you can see the golden asking for social contact, sniffing, barking, and all the other behaviors. And uh, with Blue Terriers, I had three people uh, writing about hunting lizards. And this is my staffy. I, I miss her so much. And, and she, she had so many things she liked that she could always find something um, to um, make her feel better or make her feel happy. And, and the one advice that I give to people is to um, teach a young dog to enjoy as many activities as possible because that will make so much easier to uh, recover from stress or to help the dog when the dog is stressed. And I was making a list of all the answers. So the first mm, three um, coping strategies, the, the most um, answer that I got were about chewing, destroying, playing with toys, and chewing, destroying, you remember the, the destruction box, playing with toys and holding something in the mouth, then social play, hunting, social contact, uh, water, safe space, running, resource control, and sexual behavior. So I was trying to categorize the answers, and I ended up with three groups, predatory behaviors, social interactions, or what I also call tend and befriend, and physical activity. Sorry, I'm running because I want to finish on time and I have two minutes. So the last, this is the last slide. Coping strategies are not a behavior modification program. They do, they, they, we, I don't use it in that way. They don't work in that way. The dog does not change the perception of the stimulus. So it's not counter conditioning. What may change is the dog ability to cope with stress and the ability to include us in solution to a problem because we are the ones providing effective coping strategies. And you see here, um, it's again gone so, uh, sorry for choosing him again. I wanted another dog and I couldn't find a picture. You can see Gonzo reacting to a male. Um, but um, then when he, he, he can feel the positive presence of the owners, instead of increasing uh, the intensity of the aggression, he's able to move away from uh, the cells. Um, I will not show the video because we are running out of time. I can put it in uh, in um, the web page if you want, in the Facebook page if you want. So if you want to find me, I'm I'm really, you know, bad at, at this part. But here there are some um, places where you can find me and some of um, um, the titles that I also translated in English. So let's get out of it. So I could talk about this topic for a week. So I hope you got some suggestion or some information that might be useful. And I, as, as the last time, I will now uh, read the comments. And if you had any question, I, I will be happy to, to answer. And you can write to me anytime. I will always answer, sometimes not immediately, but I'm on lockdown here. And so I have plenty of time. So thanks for joining me. Hope my English wasn't that bad and she wasn't parking. So I'm happy about it. No one was walking in front of my garden. Our garden is not mine. So thank you for, so much for being there. Uh, I 
it was amazing for me to be able to talk about something that's so meaningful for me. Hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much and bye bye.